Well, thank you very much for uh, participating in tonight's site supervisor panel presentation. We have a number of presenters, uh, and uh, you can see the uh, individuals as well as the organizations they represent on the screen. Down below you see Dr. Pat Franks, this is yours truly. Uh, and and on the right, uh, Melissa LaFranchise, most of you have uh, at least communicated with Melissa. She's responsible for putting this uh, very uh, complex uh, program together for us. This is the third evening that we're doing it. And I'm going to start right now with our first presenter, John, from the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco. Uh to begin with, I want to just introduce myself. I'm John Stuckey. I've been with the Asian nearly 20 years, and I have been uh, uh, having interns um, from the San Jose's program since about 2006, and it's been a great blessing to me. And uh, as you can see here, uh, I have on this first slide a little introduction to the library. It, uh, as I say, an integral part of the museum's mission and research uh, process. Uh, what uh, my internship entails is it, it, there's an emphasis on cataloging. Uh, you see here on this slide uh, a shot from our main stack area. We have two stack areas. And, but uh, there's a little bit of everything done. I have uh, a personal philosophy that, that if one should, if one is going to administrate a library, run a department, or an entire library, you should really have had some hands-on experience with all aspects of running a library, this being a small library. Uh, one can uh, be exposed to a variety of different things, but again, the emphasis is on cataloging. Uh, as far as qualifications, uh, I would really want to be easy. I want to to encourage a variety of potential interns, uh, and I think I, I come from the point of view that that you're you're still starting at a starting point. And so uh, I, I'm not expecting a lot of knowledge. If you've got some cataloging background, that's great. If you don't, that has been working fine, too. Um, I don't expect um, Asian language knowledge. That would help. But it's certainly, you know, majority of my interns don't have any background. I did have one uh, recently who had a background in classical Japanese, and she helped with cataloging a lot of, of 19th century Japanese books that we hadn't, I hadn't had the time to catalog myself, and it was quite a blessing, and she did a beautiful job. Uh, I do uh, have one requirement, enthusiasm. Uh, I want this to be a fun learning experience, and I also like to acknowledge my interns for what they have to teach me. So uh, here is a view. Uh, the library is located on the fourth floor of the building, and this is looking at the reading room, which is what you enter first. And you'll see right in the center an old card catalog. We still use it. We have about a little less than a third of our collection on the card catalog. But we have just received a couple of grants and we're going to start converting all of that to online. And the push from our director and our chief curator is to have our records eventually available through OCLC on WorldCat so anybody can see what we do have. That, and uh, I just want to conclude that I encourage questions. Anyone can call me anytime during the week. Uh, my phone number is right there, 415-581-3692. And my email is right there, jstucky, S-T-U-C-K-Y, at asianart.org. Please contact me. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much, John. And next speaker. You're welcome. We enjoyed having you. And our, our next speaker, we have two individuals uh, on the screen, Julie Cohen and Judy Kilkin. And uh, I believe we have uh, Judy here with us this evening to speak about the opportunities they have at the San Jose Public Library. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Judy right now. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, I'm Judy Kleiken with Partners in Reading. Um, we're the Adult and Family Literacy Program with San Jose Public Library in the city of San Jose. Um, most of you may be surprised to find out that almost 45% of the adults in San Jose have some type of 19% of the adults have um, uh, functional literacy problems where completing a job application or reading a TV guide is impossible for them and another 29% just get by. So they really, the people in San Jose, the adults in San Jose really need our services. We provide adult and family literacy, English as a second language, um, and and computer literacy, and this is w this is our internship position, coordinator of our computer lab. Um, Partners in Reading provide services by training um, volunteer tutors uh, as well as volunteer computer instructors. Um, this past year, we've trained and had over 329 active volunteers in the program and serve about 411 adults. Um, the PAR team is innovative and fun. Um, we invite you to join us and learn um, not only um, to be supportive and helpful to the adults in the program, but to learn and grow. Um, we're hardworking and committed, um, and it's a, it's a great experience. Um, we have a number of MLIS and SLIS um, uh, um, Students that are in the program um, that tutor as well as instruct in the in the computer lab. The coordinator of computer instruction would work with training and recruiting um, instructor volunteer instructors in the program. Um, our last coordinator developed an online training program, which is which is great, um, as well as provided and developed um, a number of documents that are really helpful in training. Um, what the computer lab provides is self-instruction as well as scheduled instruction with volunteers as well as workshops for adults. Adults may want to open an email account. They may want to um, find out how to search on the Internet. Um, it may be as basic as working with um, and learning the keyboard. Um, so what the volunteers do in the program is provide a whole range of support. And what you as coordinator would do uh, would be to support those volunteers that are in the program. Help match adults who are interested in working with and learning from, from the volunteers as well as supporting the volunteers. Um, uh, if you're interested in really making a difference in an adult's life, um, sharing your knowledge of computer skills as well as developing uh, skills to support literacy, if you've got good communication skills and project management, um, and like to work with a, with a knowledgeable, fun, committed team, please uh, contact me at Partners in Reading. Um, either by emailing um, a resume and letter of interest to judy.kleiken at sjlibrary.org, or you can call 408-808-2361. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That was a very interesting uh, opportunity for students. Our students uh, have a core competency. Uh, K, where they demonstrate that they can develop instructional materials, and this would be a perfect uh, situation for any of our students. So I do hope that you receive applications. 
Our next presenter is Laura Moody from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. And uh, this sounds very interesting as well. So Laura, I'm going to hand the uh, mic over to you. All right, thank you very much. Hello. I am the Public Services Librarian at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. And we've been open just about two years now. And we have a lot of work to do. As you can see here, we strive to be the most comprehensive repository of materials relating to the history of rock and roll. We're closely affiliated with the education department over at the Rock Hall, although we're two miles away. There was no room for us to actually house our collection at the museum, so we ended up two miles away over at the uh, Cuyahoga Community College. So we have a variety of patrons. We have college students members of the general public, museum members, uh, museum curators, the education department staff. They all use our collections, just fans of rock and roll. So we have a, a diverse clientele and a variety of tasks to accomplish. So I'm going to talk fast because we have a lot of different types of internships. And they're all arranged here and um, described on these slides for you to look at later. So we've basically got four, usually five different types of archival intern internships, sorry. Uh, the first one here is the archival processing internship. And that's pretty much archival arrangement, preservation, and description. We've got a lot of cataloging to do, so we are also welcoming cataloging and metadata interns. We hope, though, that catalogers will come to us with some cataloging behind them, maybe with a cataloging class or some, you know, in-person cataloging experience, mostly because there's only eight full-time librarians and we have a lot of things to do. So we don't have a lot of time to handhold people and give them a lot of training. So hopefully, especially in the cataloging internship, they will come with come to us with already some knowledge and hopefully some RDA knowledge as well because we're starting to use RDA. So moving on, collection development is also an internship that we offer. They would work under me as the public services librarian. And that is just, again, um, looking at our collection, seeing what gaps we still need to fill, working with me and and using vendor software and things of that nature, looking at our budget, deciding what formats to uh, purchase and whatnot. Digital projects. This one is not always available, but we have a lot of digital projects that we also need to accomplish. And again, like this says, uh, scanning, entering metadata in a digital asset management system, a lot of interface design right now, for example, we're reworking our website, so we would need some help in the uh, behind the scenes workability of providing a new website to our patrons. And then we've got the reference internship. That is pretty much what it suggests. We do have two reference desks. We call our our reference desk in the library reading room, the information desk. So we've got the information desk that is staffed by um, degreed librarians. And then there's the archives reading room desk as well, which is staffed by degreed archivists. So there would be two opportunities to work in the public view in the um, reference internship. And I'm more open to people coming without a whole lot of experience because when we sit together at the desk and do projects together, it's more of a learning situation than just sort of throwing it in there and having to do a lot of work. So our internships usually go right through the Rock Hall website itself. I believe the link will be posted at the end. Everybody goes through the Museum Human Resources Department. There is a web link that you follow, and there's an application procedure there. Everyone must undergo a background check because you will be dealing with um, rare and priceless materials. So a background check is essential. And you know, like my colleague said from the art museum, we're looking for people with enthusiasm and we want people to have fun, but at the same time, we all pretty much put
our nose to the grindstone every day because there is so much that we have to do. So it's a fun environment. It is all about rock and roll. We're surrounded by music every single day, and it is our subject specialty, music and popular music. The Rock Call does define rock and roll very broadly, and we do support both the museum mission and the education mission of the museum. So we're a big family that work together despite our geographic differences. And so if you could handle that sort of thing, we hope that you will apply for one of our internships. You have to work hard, like to be proactive. Sometimes you have to work alone. So our past interns have been most successful based on their ability to uh, be quick learners, inquisitive when necessary, willing to pretty much do anything that we ask of them, respecting our in-house rules, respecting each other, and respecting the tasks that are assigned. Here's the contact information. Our deadlines are down below. Our deadlines are a bit broader since we have a lot of um, information to pass out, but that's the uh, contact information for how to apply. And I believe that's it for me. Thank you very much. It's interesting that you have such a variety of opportunities for the students. And I believe you're the first uh, site supervisor during this fall's panel presentations that mentioned uh, the necessity of having a background check. Probably not the only one that does it, but the first that brought that up, and that's very important for students to know. Next, we have two individuals again shown on the screen. But Maureen is the person representing uh, the archive today, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Maureen right now. Uh, thank you very much, Pat. And it, it will meet, be me. Erin will be joining us for the question and answer period. Um, and if you hear a bulk and brass band, you can raise your hand and I'll close the door. This is Ethnomusicology. Um, this is a shot of the Ethnomusicology Archive. We are obviously an audiovisual archive. We hold over 150,000 uh, sound, primarily sound recordings. We are among the largest ethnographic sound archives in North America. In fact, the only uh, ethnographic sound archive that is larger is the Library of Congress, the American Folklife Center. We have commercial uh, recordings, commercially produced recordings, as well as field recordings. We represent every continent except, obviously, Antarctica. Uh, we have folk music, traditional music, pop music, and art music. Again, Africa, Asia, Australia, the Americas, the Pacific Islands, Europe, the Middle East. We have particularly strong holdings in Africa, Asia, particularly East Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, and Native North America. Um, one of the nice things about the Ethnomusicology Archive, and, and we always think this is good for the interns, is we are in fact not part of the library at UCLA. We are part of the Department of Ethnomusicology. And the UCLA Department of Ethnomusicology is the only freestanding Department of Ethnomusicology in North America. It was founded in 1960. Uh, the, founding the founder of the institute was a faculty member, a very well-known faculty member uh, named Mantle Hood. And one of the things that he believed was very important was not only the study of music, but that he felt to really learn about music, that you had to play an instrument, and that you had to be able to listen to recordings of other cultures. So at the same time the institute was founded, an instrument collection was begun, and the archive um, was founded. So we opened our doors October 13, 1961. Um, there I am. So we have a lot of possible internships uh, because we are, Erin is not here, but Erin and I are the complete full-time staff. So we, we get probably the most requests for people who are interested in archival processing. What you would be processing here would be our field recording collections. And those are often a lot of fun, quite frankly, because it's primarily audio because, again, that is our, our collection interest, so there would be field recordings of cultural researchers, ethnomusicologists, anthropologists, uh, sometimes we get linguists, but who go out in the field and do their own work, and they deposit their recordings, so there could be recordings, there could be slides, there can be photos, there can be 
journals, there can be field notes, um, it's a very wide variety. So those, those are often very interesting collections to process. Um, if you are interested in preservation and digitization, we do have those options available for students. One thing that we do request, if, if you are a student and you are interested in learning how to digitize audiovisual materials, um, is that we ask you do the, the long internship hours, which I believe is 180 hours at SJSU. Uh, and we ask that because it's, it's, a, it's a fairly substantial time commitment on our part to train an intern to do AV digitization. And so if you do a very short frame of, of time, like 90 hours, basically by the time you're trained, you're gone. So, so for us, it's, it's, it's 180 hours for you. Cataloging in EAD if anyone is interested. Um, I am a cataloger. I've cataloged here for many, many years. So you don't have to come with previous cataloging experience. Um, I get the rare cataloging student, but not a lot, so I would be happy to get one. Um, one of our other things, which, which is probably something that is going to be unique to a uh, cultural heritage institution, is um, if you are interested in intellectual property, that's something that we um, could probably work with uh, because this archive was founded over 50 years ago. A lot of our collections, the kind of paperwork that would now be required was not required then. So that's a big concern for us if anyone is interested in that. Um, and our, our last one is out, uh, similar to that is outreach and repatriation. One of the things, uh, let me backtrack a little. We are unlike a cultural heritage museum, as I, I will quote someone who is recently uh, here. The Asian Art Museum has cultural heritage. What audiovisual archives collect are what's called intangible cultural heritage. And so when we talk about repatriating materials, we're not talking about giving them giving them the object itself back. We're talking about giving, in our case, the sound back. And repatriation is a very important part of any ethnographic sound archive. We want to return the materials to the indigenous peoples from whom they were originally recorded. So if you are interested in that, that is something that we do. And as I said, it's probably fairly unique to ethnographic sound archives. The British Library, for example, um, does a lot of cultural repatriation. Um, in terms of our qualifications, we have fairly broad qualifications because we are an ethnographic sound archive. I think in this case, everyone would probably be uh, a library and information science uh, student. But in fact, we will take ethnomusicology graduate students, moving image archive students, museum study students. Um, it is nice if you are familiar with content standards like AACR2 and DAX, or structural standards like MARC and EAD, but it is not a requirement. The one thing that we do ask is that you have a specific interest in either audiovisual or ethnographic archives. If you are interested in very general archival work, this we may not be as of much interest to you. Um, but on the other hand, we have an intern right now who was an anthropology undergraduate. And he was very excited to work here because obviously he has an interest in ethnographic materials. So those are probably for us what we would really like is that you're really interested in AV or you're really interested in ethnographic archives. Um, there's the archive staff. That is our recording technician, David, on the left. If you're looking at the slide, that's Aaron in the pink shirt. That is the legendary Tony Seeger, who was our uh, archive director till very recently. Yes, Charles Seeger is his grandfather, and Pete is his uncle. And that's me on the far right. And if you are interested, please email a cover letter of introduction and a resume. And I think that's it, the end. Thank you. I love that picture. Very nice. And uh, quite a number of opportunities for students. Again, it was good to hear that. Uh, and I think you're right. Uh, an interest in the topic really helps uh, a motivated, enthusiastic student is what you're looking for. So uh, I do hope that you have a few applicants. We now have uh, Lisa, uh, who is going to speak to us about the uh, Autry National Center for the American West. I think this is the only site uh, that uh, has been presented tonight that I have actually had the opportunity to visit and was very impressed. So right now I'll turn the mic over to Lisa. Hello. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Pat, for inviting me to this. Um, so before I go and talk about who I am and what I do, I think to get a grasp of the Autry National Center first is a good way to go. So the Autry National Center is actually a combination of a couple of museums. One is the Museum of Western Heritage, um, the other is um, the Women of the West Museum, and the third museum is the Southwest Museum of the American Indian. Um, and these three museums merged in 2003 to create the Autry National Center. Uh, the two museums that had libraries and archives is the Autry Resource Center, and you'll see that picture on the left, which is located in our Griffith Park campus, which is across from the LA Zoo. And the second library is the Braun Research Library, which was uh, pretty much the collection started when the Southwest Museum started in 1907. And that's located in our Mount Washington, for those that live in Los Angeles, the Mount Washington area is close to Highland Park, Dodger Stadium. The two campuses are about eight miles apart. So the Autry National Center is a museum and it's dedicated to exploring and sharing the stories, experiences, and perceptions of, of the diverse peoples of the American West. That's our mission statement. Um, in support of this mission, the libraries and archives of the Autry provide access to one of the nation's most comprehensive book, archival, and artifact collections on American Indian cultures and Western history. So we have a number of collections within our two libraries, but another thing that is unique to our museum is that we provide researchers access if we can, if there's no conservation issue um, or exhibit issue, we provide them access to our museum collections as well for research. Um, but they first need to come to the libraries to, to talk to us to get that access, and we work very, very closely with them in that regard. So the two internships that we have available, I should say, had available um, has an internship on both sides. The first slide here is the Access and Preservation Internship, which is the intern at the Griffith Park campus. And you would have been working with Marva Felchlin. She's the director of the Libraries and Archives of the Autry. And it's working with the correspondence from the Jean Autry um, personal uh, personal papers. Um, and I'm using it in the past tense because this archive internship has, or access and preservation internship has been filled. Um, that's the bad news, but it was filled by a San Jose student who um, contacted us as soon as we got the description out on your database. So it actually was filled, like I found out this morning. So I apologize for not being able to um, get the slide out. But there is a possibility that it will be offered next year. So she is only offering internships once a year. Um, many of the people who spoke today talked about their uh, limited staff. We're no different. We have about, uh, we have four library staff members that are permanent, three of which are degree librarians and are full-time. One is a, um, uh, she's a jack of all trades and helps us out with everything, but she's only part-time and we have a couple full-time processing archivists. But we are a small staff, so unfortunately that means we're limited on the types of internships that we can provide. The second internship, which is still available, and this is um, the internship that would be supervised by me, Lisa Fosas, um, at the Brown Research Library. And that reminds me that I didn't actually tell you what my position is. I am the head librarian for the Braun Research Library and the archivist for the Autry National Center. So that means all the collections in the Braun Research Library I manage and I also provide access to research, researchers too, and I also um, manage the archives and manuscript materials on both sites. Um, my internships, because of, of the largest part of my hours is at the Braun, pretty much all my internships are at the Braun. And it is probably the most flexible of internships because um, the Broad Research Library, formerly known as the Southwest Museum Library, was founded and started its collections in 1907. And we have, um, because of that, uh, the, the research library collected everything except the 3D objects and textiles. So we have maps. We have audiovisual, we have photographs, and we also, of course, have published materials as well. So we, I need help in all these various areas. And what I need help mostly with is um, 
hands-on physical processing. So it could be physical processing of archival collections, but it also could be physical processing of ephemera material, posters, broadsides. Um, we have an intern right now doing an audiovisual um, survey. So this is where I try to match my top needs with um, the interns. Um, but I do try to make sure that each intern has a uh, project that's well-rounded and have a really um, a solid beginning and end so that when you leave, you actually feel like you have something that you can walk away with and you said that I did this piece of project. So the, the end of the internship usually is punctuated by some written or essay or product, nothing too fancy, but it just, I find that it makes it a nice um, cohesive internship for many. Uh, and then I do really try to work with the various interns that come in. I do prefer that, uh, that they at least have a familiarity with the language that you can get from basic classes that involve archival description and um, archival administration. Um, cataloging, which has been mentioned a lot, also helps as well because cataloging uh, more or less description seems to be part of what we do every day. Um, so the requirements to preferred qualification, like I said, coursework in basic archival theory and in administration, again, just so that we can kind of start off in the same language. And if you come across anything that you might have questions about in the practical sense or the theoretical sense, we can, you know, discuss that along the way. Um, excellent communication and writing skills. This kind of goes along with our internships just are, it's teamwork, but it's also, uh, a, I do expect interns at a good point of their internship to be able to work alone, and this works well for me to keep up with the progress if we can communicate really well with each other in regards to what's going on, what are some of the issues, what are challenges, how much, how often do we need to meet in between your internships. Um, I'll be physically in the same place as you are, but our building is a three-story building, so a lot of times we're in separate areas of the, of the same building. And writing skills, again, helps in, in communicating um, what you need, but also, like I said, at the end of the, the project, there's like a blog story or something that involves some sort of writing. Um, experience in historical research using authoritative sources of primary documents just helps you understand the types of material you'll be working with. Because pretty much everything, even the published material that um, most of our interns work with are historic in nature um, and kind of walk that fine line between primary and secondary sources. Um, for the access internship, like I said, is already already uh, filled. Uh, there is a preferred qualification of related experience in film or television history. But this kind of goes along with what Maureen was saying is it really does help um, and I think it becomes more of a win-win situation when the intern is, is interested in the research topics found in our collections. And again, for the broad, that is a wide array. So it's American Indian cultures. There's a lot of local history of Los Angeles and Southern California, food tourism, tourism, archaeology, anthropology, ethnography, ethnomusicology. In fact, um, you know, uh, one of my internships was with, was with Maureen, Maureen at the ethnomusicology archive. So um, we have a lot of music. Uh, collections, and we also have a lot of photographic collections. In fact, our biggest collection are the documentary photographs that we have. Um, and then, again, specific projects will be based on what we need, first of all, and we usually find interns that have a particular skill set or interest, and we can usually find something, a project that fits within that. Um, but like I said, I think the, uh, the most Excuse me, sorry about that. The, um, the most needed internship is the, the hands-on preservation work. Uh, the, the Broad Research Library is gearing up for a move to a different location, so before we can move any of the materials, we have to get them stable, so that's my number one priority. Um, and there is a picture, a couple pictures of of me in the broad reading room. So to the left, you'll see our cataloger, myself in the middle, and Manola Madrid. Uh, we are, a, a, you know, staffing a booth at one of the events. We like to do a lot of outreach. Um, and uh, any intern that uh, works at the Autry actually ends up working with all of the library staff because we do 
so much together. We're a really uh, close-knit team. And um, I have to say this is probably one of the best teams I've ever had to work with in my career. So as an intern, it would be good to, to see how we work and why it works and, and how we work as a team. And then the second um, picture on the right with the great orange carpet is the broad reading room. And you'll see two volunteers and an intern and me walking through the door. And um, I like that picture because it's lively. We get people who are smart, who want to be involved, but are just really anxious and really anxious learners. Um, and that's my contact information. Um, we do have a blog. A blog is a great way to see more closely the different types of collections we have, as well as sort of the, the spirit of our team, again, because the blog is personal, and I think a lot of our personalities come out in different stories. So I highly suggest you check that out. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Another fascinating presentation. I think we'd all like to uh, spend some time at each one of these sites just to find out what it's really like. Uh, and I uh, have now um, a slide with all of your pictures and uh, names here. And uh, I wonder if anybody has any questions of anyone else. I have a couple of questions myself, but I'll wait for a second. Okay, well, what I was wondering first, I think that, uh, Judy, uh, on your listing, uh, it was mentioned that perhaps there are virtual internships as well as on-site. It seems that all of the other listings are strictly on-site. Do you know if that is the case, if there are virtual listings available? Um, actually, it's a combination of on-site as well as virtual. We have um, a very flexible schedule that can be arranged depending upon, um, depending upon the, the, the intern's needs and the intern's schedule. Um, and a good amount of the, the um, work can be done virtually. Um, but we do ask for at least um, two to three hours a week to be on site um, at, at uh, Partners in Reading. Very good. I'm glad I asked that because then it is uh, what we might call a hybrid opportunity, uh, which makes sense and that's, that's uh, very good to know. And then I was also wondering, because we're so, or I am, uh, usually involved with the virtual interns who have more flexibility in getting their work done, I was wondering if any of you had any comments about hours and days that students are expected to be at your site and how that works out for most interns. Hello, this is Lisa. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Um, we yeah. have Okay, sorry about that. It sounded a little bit different. But anyhow, um, I, thank you for bringing that up. I did forget to say that. Uh, our library is only open Monday through Friday, and we usually take interns between 9 a.m. to 5 o'clock. And the, and the 5 o'clock hour is firm because our whole campus closes down at 5 o'clock. Um, but uh, I do usually have interns do a few hours. I make sure there's a few hours of the internship that's off-site. Um, so that helps with, with the, the, the completion of um, the requirement of hours that they need. And I also forgot to mention, like with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you also need to go through a background check at the Autry. Oh, very good. Well, hi, Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Not to scare you about the background check. It's nothing to worry about, but you do have to do it. We all had to do it. But I, we're also open to similar hours. We're usually open, you know, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. We're closed to the public on Monday, but we can take interns on Mondays. And we are open on Saturdays. So there's a bit of flexibility, but no evening hours, really, or many weekend hours. Okay, thank you. And I see that Maureen has her hand raised. Yes. So I'm Maureen. trying to be polite. Um, I was just going to say in terms of the ethnomusicology hours, we're, as long as it's Monday through Friday, because like everyone else, I think we're closed on Saturday and Sunday, um, we have archive hours, archive intern hours available from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So we have a big range for people. We, we try to accommodate. So you do have evening hours. That's good. I see that Judy's um, mic is still on. So Judy, do you have anything to add? Uh, 
Yes, I just wanted to mention that our hours are Monday through Friday, um, nine, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and then evenings, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday until 8 o'clock. And then we're also opened on Saturday from 9 to 12. So for um, any intern that would be interested, um, you know, the hours are flexible, both evening as well as weekends, as well as during the day. Thank you. And um, I had another um, thought as uh, I think one of you were speaking, and I forgot which one, mentioned a paper, that, a research paper that a student was doing. And our students uh, must work the required number of hours. When they sign up for a course, they pay for the number of credits. So one of you mentioned the student must, for preservation, I think digitization, work 180 hours. That's four credits. So they do pay for four credits and they're enrolled in a course, that means that they must work uh, that uh, number of hours. And uh, I have found that sometimes work comes, uh, starts and then stops for some reason. And some sites actually do incorporate a research paper for the site. It could be uh, something that the site needs done. But they uh, give that as the student's assignment right in the beginning of the semester so that if there is a lull in the work uh, that's coming in, they're able to work on that throughout the semester. And uh, I don't know if any of uh, others of you require some type of research project like that. I'm just wondering. Laura? Oh yeah, I'm raising my hand. Uh, I don't require it, but I have often used that method when I know there might, one, I wanted to help the students. So I have a lot of projects. I have an intern right now, for example, that did a whole project on just library chat. And that helped me a lot. So I do use that method. That is a good idea, and if it's something that you're interested in getting research accomplished on and don't have the time, uh, the students can certainly help out. Uh, that's now, that's I, exactly the reason, yep. Yep, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and then that way they don't worry about their hours either because that's the one thing they panic about most on our end. Uh, the other thing they panic about is um, not being able to reach the site supervisor or having infrequent communication. And it seems like all of you are doing uh, as much as possible in order to keep up some type of communication schedule. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, what I'm going to do then is uh, thank you very much for presenting. And as I said, we're taping this presentation. It will be recorded. The recording will go out to students uh, after the session, in fact, later this evening. And then it will also be turned into a webcast. It will be on our internship website so that uh, students can listen to your um, presentations and get a little more, uh, a better sense, I think, of the opportunities available to them. So thank you very much.